Well, good morning, everyone uh, in North America, and good afternoon uh, or good evening to our European friends. My name is Aaron Woodrick. I'm the director of the Domestic Policy Program at the McDonald Laurier Institute in Ottawa. And I'm very pleased uh, that you're joining us today for uh, what I think will prove to be a very interesting webinar on the subject of hydrogen, um, a opportunity for German Canadian partnership. This is being put on both by MLI and with our friends and partners in Germany, Epico. Um, and so uh, before I get to our experts, I think it's only that I introduce everyone and then we'll get right into the conversation. Um, we'll start first, of course, with Bert Weber, who's the founder and director of Epico and is going to have some short remarks uh, after I finish the introductions. We have Heather Exner Perot, he, who's a senior fellow with us at the McDonald Laurier Institute. Uh, we have Philip Rung, who's uh, chair of economic theory at Friedrich Alexander University. We have Matthew Klippenstein, who is joining us from the Canadian Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Association. And last but not least, Jens Hanen, who's a consultant with Adelphi. Thank you all very much for taking the time. I know that it's, uh, we have disparate time zones, but we found a time for us all to get together. I'm very much looking forward to, uh, to the conversation today. With that, Berndt, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Aaron. And uh, very good afternoon or good morning, depending on which side of the Atlantic you are. Um, on behalf of Epico, I'd also like to welcome you to this webinar on the topic, which has recently made it into the headlines, um, the German-Canadian Partnership on Hydrogen. And we all um, have seen the pictures of uh, the Prime Minister Trudeau and the Chancellor Scholz announcing their intention to work together and to bring stable and secure supply of hydrogen to meet the German demand. And of course, from a German perspective, this is good news, because we need to replace um, gas supplies from Russia um, and, of course, also with regard to our ambition to become a net zero country in terms of CO2 emissions um, by 2045. And imports are actually really crucial in achieving this, because even if we manage in Germany um, to achieve our national target to install uh, 10 gigawatts um, um, of uh, capacity for electrolyzers, this represents only a fraction of Germany is going to need in 2030 in terms of hydrogen. So imports therefore will um, be crucial. They will need to cover the majority um, 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 of, of the hydrogen in Germany. And this also makes sense, not only from um, the perspective of security of supply, but also um, in terms of an economic perspective. Um, it's not only reasonable, but it's also necessary. So a partnership with countries where you can actually cost efficiently produce hydrogen is key for Germany and Canada for many reasons has been identified as a partner of first, of first choice and I think rightly so. Now, through the cooperation with the MLI, I think we have a unique opportunity to bring together the two perspectives, um, the Canadian supply perspective and the German demand perspective. And this, uh, this, often, this combined perspective, I think, is often missing in the debate and very much needed. So, of course, we are still at a very early stage when it comes to um, um, hydrogen um, partnership uh, between the two countries. And um, therefore, it's crucial that we analyze what lies ahead of us in terms of economic, in terms of um, technological and uh, um, regulatory challenges. And of course, we also want to contribute to solutions. So um, through the discussion and through a paper which we are going to release in a few days, we are planning on doing exactly this. And now I'm very much looking forward um, to the presentation and afterwards um, to the discussion. And without further ado, I hand it over to you, Philip. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Bernd, and thank you very much, um, Aaron. Um, I want to uh, share my screen now. Give me one second, please. Um, now you should see my screen. Is this right? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Um, yeah, I want to um, start now with the German perspe per perspective. So with the demand of Germany uh, for hydrogen and e-fuels. And what you can see here is the uh, predicted demand for Germany for hydrogen and e-fuels in the future. So Germany wants to be um, net zero at 2045. And at this time, we will have uh, hydrogen and e-fuel demand between, let's say, 300 terawatt hours and 800 or even 900 terawatt hours a year. Um, it always depends between the certain parameters, um, which are 
um, underlined in the scenarios um, and in the um, more recent studies that we have this um, net zero goal in 2045 in previous studies we had for example a re reduction just by 80 percent or 95 percent and this means that the later studies show much more hydrogen than the ones which are published like two or three years ago so uh, when we would assume just 600 terawatt hours of hydrogen and e-fuels it wouldn't end up at around between 1000 and 1500 terawatt hours of electricity, um, which we had to produce for this. Um, and just to give you a comparison, at the moment, the electricity generation within Germany, so with the lignite, with coal, with nuclear power, is just around 500 terawatt hours. Um, and when we have a look into the renewables in Germany, it's just between 200 and 250 terawatt hours a year. So. Um, it becomes very clear at this point that Germany will not produce all the hydrogen and e-fuels it needs within Germany, but we have to import. And this is also what our national hydrogen strategy says. But how to import hydrogen? How can you do it? Um, so first of all, the volumetric energy density is very low for hydrogen. This means you have a lot of volume and just a very little of energy content. And what you can do is, for example, you can compress the hydrogen um, here, for example, to 200 bar. Then you can use it, for example, in a pipeline, can transport it like this, or you, you use a trailer. What you also can do is to liquefy hydrogen. This is around at minus 260 degrees Celsius, so it's very low, um, but then you have a liquid and this one you can also transport. And the last option which you have and where you really can increase the energy density in terms of volume is to synthesis or to synthesize certain products like methanol or methane or naphtha. Um, and then you can increase the hydrogen, uh, the energy density. And this always means that transport gets cheaper. Um, what we also did was um, uh, analysis for Germany where we could get the hydrogen and its derivates from. Um, and we focused on uh, six countries or seven countries uh, with uh, very good conditions for renewables. So these are really the places where renewables are the cheapest in the world. Um, and of course, Canada plays an important role here. You can see we have um, hydroelectric uh, power and of course we have good wind conditions here. And when we compare the import costs for methanol, for example, um, for example here, uh, what you can see is Canada and you compare it with Australia, you can see one big advantage, okay, you have less transport costs, so it's cheaper because the distance is closer, um, but this is not really, um, it's, it's not so important as you can see because um, we transport here methanol, which is very energy dense and um, the transport distance is not, not so important here, but what is much more important is the question about the electricity prices. And in Canada, we do have hydroelectric, which allows us to produce hydrogen in very many full load hours per year and for very cheap prices. So even if you look at the best places in the world, Canada is one of the best under these. And with these words, I want to hand over to Heather. Well, thanks for that, Philip, and for some visual aspects there. I wanted to just touch on, on the political aspects of this trade. Um, we actually started working on this uh, paper with our colleagues before the chancellor and, and uh, the prime minister met and before it became a big news item. But in fact, Germany and Canada had an MOU on energy partnership in 2021, which specifically mentioned hydrogen. And so I've been working on this, you know, for longer than just, you know, six weeks ago. Um, but, it, but it did become very much a political kind of a thing. So in, in Canada, natural resources have become very politicized. It's become an aspect of our domestic politics. And there is, I think, some concern that 
Um, on the one hand, people who advocate for exporting natural resources were very disappointed that LNG wasn't discussed, that this seemed like a missed opportunity. The Germans require LNG uh, in the short and medium term uh, very badly uh, with, with the Russian war uh, and wanting to provide that LNG to Germany. Uh, but I think this might detract from the fact that we should have both, that it, it's not LNG versus hydrogen in the, you know, in, in kind of the economic and the political sphere, that hydrogen regardless of what you think of, of exporting LNG or not, hydrogen is also a very important opportunity and can attract investment is an area where Canada um, can be a good partner and, and add to our, our, our kind of our prosperity and our wealth. And so what people might not appreciate is that within the last two years, not only Canada, but also BC, Alberta, Quebec, and Ontario have all put out hydrogen strategies looking to be part of that global hydrogen market. And so this is not a left or a right issue uh, unless we turn it into one. But there are actors on all sides that see hydrogen as, as a real scalable economic opportunity. Um, in Alberta and, and BC, and obviously Matthew will speak to this more, blue, we have excellent potential in blue hydrogen. So um, using natural gas with carbon capture. But that is much more likely to be exported you know, to Asia, to California. Uh, so th on the East Coast is where we, we have more potential for green hydrogen, uh, where you have some wind, you certainly have hydroelectricity. There are some EU uh, restrictions or frameworks that I know uh, Philip will discuss that doesn't, it doesn't make it, you know, not just any electricity in, in Eastern Canada can go towards making hydrogen, which will be um, desirable in Germany and the EU, but there is potential there. And, and so how I wanted to frame it is that it, it doesn't have to be LNG or hydrogen. This is an opportunity. There are multi-billion uh, dollar investments already in Western Canada. Uh, there, are, there are, you know, 100 million plus investments in Eastern Canada. Industry is interested in this. Uh, and so it's something that people on all sides can maybe finally hydrogen is what will bring natural resource opinions together in Canada. So I'm just going to turn it over to Philip to talk about some of the EU and the German kind of parameters of how they see um, supporting. And then I'll talk about some of the challenges that we'll have in Canada on the regulatory side of actually getting thing, getting product to market, which is always a problem for us. Yes, uh, thank you very much, um, Heather. Um, I share my screen again. Uh, one second. Now you should see it, I guess. Um, uh, yeah, it's about the regulatory framework we have in the EU at the moment. And um, I think um, what is important to know is that in Germany and in Europe, um, there's not such a CO2-based approach. When you talk about hydrogen, it's more a color coding uh, thing. So we divide very uh, much between green hydrogen, for example, on the one hand, and blue hydrogen on the other hand. And the green, green hydrogen in uh, Europe, and especially in Germany, is very favored um, at the moment. And this is why we uh, start at the moment uh, first to set up a regulatory framework for the green hydrogen or for the renewable hydrogen in Europe. And how does this uh, framework looks like? Um, you can see it here. So first of all, um, uh, important is that the emissions has to be minus 70% um, in comparison to gray hydrogen, so to hydrogen which is produced by steam reforming from natural gas. Um, and then we have three different cases how you can produce so-called renewable hydrogen. Uh, the first case would be this one, the grid mix. This would mean that you can link your electrolysis system directly to the grid and can produce green hydrogen when you have um, a certain amount of renewables in the electricity mix. And you need to have at least 90% renewables in the mix, in the bidding zone where your electrolysis system is located. Um, and these kind of uh, values we do not arrive or we do not match in, in, in many countries in the world and also not in Canada. So the case number one, um, is unfortunately not interested uh, or interesting for Canada at the moment. Case number two would be the direct connection. 
um, this would mean that um, you have a direct connection between your electro electrolyzer and your uh, renewable energy source, like your wind park or your PV uh, power system. Um, and you are not allowed to touch the, yeah, the local grid, the electricity grid. Um, and what is also very important, you need to build up a new PV or wind plant or a hydroelectric power plant. So it's not um, allowed to use an existing one. Um, this makes it a little bit more complicated, of course. Then we have case number three, the PPA case, or PPA stands for Power Purchase uh, Agreement. Um, and there it is allowed to use the public um, electricity grid, but you need to um, have a new installation also in the renewable source. So like in the wind or in the PV plant or whatever. Um, and you need to have a geographic and a temporal correlation. Geographic correlation means that the, um, the renewable energy source has to be in the same bidding zone like the, electro, uh, the, the electrolysis system. Um, and the temporal correlation means that, for example, when you have the PPA from a PV plant, then you are not allowed to produce renewable um, hydrogen during the night because the PV plant is not producing energy at this time. You can compensate for this when you use a battery, for example. This is allowed, but um, yeah. Uh, so you can see there are very high requirements at the moment um, in Europe. But on the bright side, um, this is um, uh, so the, the consultation process on this law or on these delegated acts um, is still running. So it's not. Um, applicable law at this very moment. But uh, yeah, we will uh, get more information um, in this autumn. Okay, this was it from my side and I give back to Heather. So, so Canada may, may be able to actually make EU regulations look simple and easy, <laughs> unfortunately. So I think probably many of our viewers on, on the Canadian side certainly will be aware that we have a problem uh, proving and getting major projects done <clears throat> that regardless of, of what it is, it often takes a decade or more. And some of it is that I think we've created a regulatory system that is meant to disincentivize oil and gas development, including LNG. And so we're seeing that, of course, you know, now, now it's well known in Canada that of 18 or 24 proposed LNG projects, depending on how you count, only two are under construction. You know, one is, is meant to be uh, exporting LNG in three years. Meanwhile, the United States has, uh, you know, developed well over a dozen in the same amount of time. So, so what is the problem on the Canadian side and will it affect hydrogen? And I think the answer very much is yes. Um, so, so not only the approval side, but if you look at everything that you need to export hydrogen, if you do need pipelines, depending on where your source is going to come from, we have examples in Canada where it's very difficult um, to build pipelines. And of course, in our case, it's been, well, it's filled with oil or natural gas and people are opposed to that. But the construction of the pipeline is just an empty pipeline. It doesn't matter what's in the pipeline when you're constructing it. Um, so in TMX, for example, the, you know, the costs have tripled and the timeline has doubled and they have to do things like archeology span digs or you know, moving anthills or removing every, you know, every nest kind of in, in, the, in the right of way because of the Migratory Birds Act. And that will affect an, a, an ammonia or a hydrogen pipeline as well. Uh, in terms of the export terminal, we have seen uh, a tanker ban on the West Coast. Uh, set the Saguenay LNG project was, was, was rejected on the basis of the harm it may pose to marine mammals. And ammonia is, is not, in terms of spills or the potential danger, I wouldn't say is, is better or more you know, more appetizing for wildlife than natural gas or oil. And the fact that it's a very new industry that we don't maybe understand the risks or how to mitigate them, as well as we do with oil and natural gas, uh, will also pose some issues. And so I think, yeah, and then there's the wind power. And, and I think there's much more political support, and that will be helpful for wind uh, than there is and for renewables than there was for oil and gas. But there are still, especially on the East Coast, you know, many migratory birds 
on, on the East Coast. And there will have to be considerations of how do you build up your wind power while respecting all of that, uh, the consultation. Um, so there, are, and, and a very underdeveloped wind energy uh, industry in Eastern Canada compared to what you have in Europe. And so when the, the Alliance says we would like to see deliveries by 2025, maybe in very small amounts, but it will take a lot longer than that, I think, and, and Matthew can, can put his two cents in. On, on the, the, none of these projects are approved yet. Um, and so the, from the approval to building the infrastructure to having, again, the use case in Europe and what is the amount and making sure that supply and demand is very closely aligned will be an uphill battle. And I think all of this speaks to the fact that as we move from a fossil fuel-based energy system to a renewable one, we are going to have to change our mindset in terms of we want to build projects, we don't want to stop projects. And if we were to build a hydrogen economy, there will need to be um, smoother systems that are not adversarial. Right now, the regulatory system in Canada is very adversarial in, in that it seems like the regulators are working, looking at ways to stop or prevent or um, apply burdens um, you know, that only if you meet the standard can you go through. And now we have to change the mindset, and probably in the EU as well, that we want to find a way to make these work. We want it to be efficient and cost effective. How can we do that? So, Aaron, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you very much, Heather and uh, Philip. I want to bring in um, uh, Matthew and uh, Jens now. What we're going to do is we're going to have a, a bit of discussion. So maybe if I could get comments uh, from the two of you on what you've already heard, could have a bit of a discussion, and then uh, we could turn over some questions. I already see a lot of uh, interesting uh, questions coming in, so I think there'll be no shortage of those. So um, uh, well, we'll just hear from um, uh, Matthew and Jens, and then uh, Heather and Philip, you can jump into if you have anything to respond to. Matthew. Uh, sure. Well, thank you very much, Aaron, and uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Bernard, uh, Philip, uh, and Heather. Um, so there's some very useful information there. Uh, one thing I will perhaps add is that Canada uh, is very geographically diverse, not, not very heavily populated, so we don't have one grid. Uh, we actually have a grid in the West Coast. Uh, we have a couple of provinces which are more or less islanded, and we have a grid uh, towards the east. And so when it comes to exporting electricity from, for example, Quebec, that grid is 99% um, hydroelectric. So in the step one case that was shown, uh, it would be possible to guarantee um, existing renewables. One challenge with uh, the use of existing projects or possibly even PPAs is that when we buy power from the grid, we have to buy the power generation costs as well as the cost of the transmission and distribution, the cost to use the wires. Uh, so in Stephenville, uh, Newfoundland, Labrador, uh, and in probably other projects we'll see, these are standalone um, wind energy projects. There's lots of wind in Atlantic Canada. And um, I expect that that will be the path forward for, for many exports to Europe. Um, I would also comment, uh, having worked in the wind sector, that while the color coding system is very useful shorthand, it's a very sticky meme, um, it does, doesn't distinguish between the uh, emissions intensity of different forms of uh, renewable energy. Uh, the IPCC, I think it was a 2014 um, report, uh, Bernie, uh, Bernstein rather, uh, recently, uh, both estimated that solar, for example, had about four times the life cycle emissions as wind. Hydroelectricity in a northern country uh, like out in Canada is typically on the order of wind as well. So. Um, recognizing that uh, you know Europe must do what it what it feels right um, the color coding system doesn't always uh, you know capture the nuance perhaps of some uh, of some situations I'll pass it over to um, uh, Jens perhaps yes thank you and yeah, I would like to uh, second um, what my colleague Matthew has been saying. So you really with these EU criteria for renewable hydrogen, um, they're going to be defined within bidding zones. And the open question that we are all very interested uh, about is exactly what the definition of the bidding zones will be in Canada. And we're expecting it to be uh, at the provincial level. 
um, which would mean that certain provinces, like you mentioned, Matthew, Quebec, but also, for example, Newfoundland and Labrador, also with the renewable electricity share um, in the electricity mix of plus 90 percent. There you would actually, um, as a project developer, be able to just plug the electrolyzer into the grid and it would count as hydrogen of renewable origin. And it's a very different situation in, um, in other provinces, um, for example, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. There really these criteria for additionality and spatial and temporal correlation will apply um, to all projects. And it's, uh, yeah, it's a very different context. But as I said, it depends on the definition of the bidding zones and if they're gonna choose to split up Newfoundland and Labrador into two bidding zones, it, it will also change uh, the conversation. Mm -hmm. So um, that's, I, I think, one important point that, that developers will need clarity on soon um, from the EU, how bidding zones will be defined abroad. And that, of course, is not only a problem in Canada, but uh, lots of other countries um, outside the EU. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't want to turn this into an LNG conversation, of course, because it's not, it's supposed to be on hydrogen, but just maybe a brief comment um, would be that, of course, Germany needs natural gas at the moment and, and very urgently so for this winter and the, and the few winters to come. But the, the issue really with Canada and LNG is that the timelines don't really match up. Germany's and Canada's timelines don't match up. So the projects that, that are sort of promising on the Atlantic coast, more or less promising. The earliest they could deliver is from 2026, 20, 27. And in Germany, we expect natural gas de demand to, of course, we, we will still have that for, for a couple of years, couple of winters especially, but from the 2030s onwards, natural gas demand is expected to decline in Germany. So in the end, it's going to be companies, of course, making these decisions, German off-takers and Canadian suppliers, are they going to be able to fix LNG contracts? But the, <clears throat> but the, the suppliers, they need a security and they need more or less 15 to 20 year, years off-take agreements. And German off-takers um, will, will not really be able to offer these, 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 these contracts because of the, that declining natural gas demand in the midterm in, in Germany. <clears throat> so just that brief comment on that note. Thank you. I'll add a few things to that on the LNG side. I think for Canada, obviously the, the better opportunity is on the West Coast and to Asia, where, where you know the population will grow by another billion people in the next 20, 30 years. And, and there is a huge, uh, there is going to be growth in demand and where they're using a ton of coal and still need to get off coal. And so the case makes so much sense on the West Coast uh, but there have been projects proposed in Canada on the East Coast. As we know, one was rejected only in February. Uh, so there are suppliers that think that there is a business case and want to put it out. Uh, Newfoundland is sitting on a pile of its own uh, LNG, and there, there are still, um, maybe the suppliers are more pessimistic or optimistic, depending on how you put it, of what LNG uh, demand will be like in Europe in 2035. But also in the short term, I mean, we are exporting a ton of natural gas to the United States and they're exporting it off their East Coast. And I think by, by importing Canadian natural gas, we're able to provide enough supply to, to buffer kind of the domestic needs in the United States that they can export uh, on all cylinders. But I wanted to just get back to some of Matthew's um, comments about the different grids and the different geographies in Canada. And you know, when, when you think about, oh, green energy to Europe, what makes sense? So the first thing that I think many people would think is Quebec hydroelectricity. We know they have a tremendous hydroelectricity uh, potential and exports are trying to export more to the United States. Uh, but when you look at Quebec's actual hydrogen strategy, it is very much focused on domestic uh, supply, that they are trying to create a hydrogen market so that they can reduce their own emissions and get off their own use of natural gas and other, other fossil fuels. Uh, same with Ontario. I think Ontario is a little bit more invested on the research and kind of the fuel cell. And Matthew, you can speak to that. But again, Ontario is not either looking at exporting hydrogen. Uh, and so that takes you to Atlantic Canada, which was obviously the focus of the Chancellor's visit. Um, you think also of Muskrat Falls, a huge hydroelectricity uh, project that is going to be providing more electricity uh, you know, than, than maybe is needed domestically. 
That seems the most obvious. But then I understand it, Philip, it doesn't fit very neatly into the EU's rules. And so here you do have a huge source of renewable electricity that's coming online. But, but right now under the regulations isn't going to be easy to turn, translate that. As you said, we can export renewable energy now, export electricity that we were never able to do before. Uh, but it seems that there's still some constraints on doing that. So um, it seems like such a sensical idea. And then when you get into the weeds, it, you know, it looks harder and harder. <laughs> but I'll turn it over to you guys. And I think uh, this is, uh, yeah, this is a problem because um, we treat electricity completely different than hydrogen, for example. When we have a um, uh, electric vehicle in Germany or in Europe and um, it consumes the normal grid mix, we consider it to be green. Uh, and when we talk about hydrogen, it has to be green from the first place. So um, this is not really a fair or a level, a level playing field between these uh, different opportunities. So this is a little bit, it's a little bit odd in, 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 in the European Union, I guess. Um, I mean, I, I agree, but you can appreciate uh, the principle that lies behind, right? You don't want, um, increased uh, electricity production from fossil fuels to go into um, yeah, el electrolysis for hydrogen production. And then in the end, you, add with, uh, you, you end up with increased net emissions. So it's sort of the princi <clears throat> principle is, 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 is really quite understandable. But at the same time, you notice that these criteria are tailored to, of course, the EU and not necessarily to producers abroad. And then um, it, the context is very different, of course, in, in, in jurisdictions as, as in Canada, where you have um, existing hydropower capacities, which provide 60% of, of electricity to the grid. So, um, but then in, in as well, due to the relaxed criteria for, for jurisdictions or bidding zones with really high renewable energy shares, um, we can also um, think of projects um, going off the ground in, in Newfoundland and Labrador, for example, that are based on wind and hydropower electricity. So it really very much depends on, 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 the, on the bidding zones again. Any other comments? Or I can start throwing some uh, some questions at you now. Um, maybe I'll start. Uh, I'll start with our uh, our German friends on this because um, you know obviously the war has created a very significant shock in terms of the political dynamic around energy. I think before the war, it was quite possible for a lot of people to sort of treat sec energy security issues as more of a hypothetical. That of course is is all too real now for our friends in Europe. So I kind of wanted to get our thoughts uh, from any of you, uh, uh, Philip Berndt. Uh, Jens on, you know, just how much has this changed um, the dynamic in Europe? Um, uh, you know, and, and this is important for our, you know Canadian audience as well because I think for a long time, um, you know, the the incumbent government was not much interested in talking about uh, energy exports, but seeing you know uh, the chancellor show up, for example, and make very clear that he's interested in Canadian energy, I think that creates um, a different uh, political dynamic in Canada that will, will pose a challenge to the Trudeau government. So um, turn it over uh, to any of you. Yes, probably I can, um, I can start. Um, Jens, so um, I would say um, more or less everything has changed. So our our plan here in Germany was to get climate neutral by 2045, um, and we wanted to do it with natural gas. Um, and this is now a little bit backfiring because the natural gas prices at the moment are like 20 times higher than uh, two or three years ago. Um, and so this everything um, this changes more or less everything. Um, and in regard to hydrogen, um, this means that I think that many projects has to be accelerated now for hydrogen. And um, we see many companies which are now really willing to invest into green hydrogen options. 
Um, and then we see, for example, the problems now with blue hydrogen, uh, because many players think that blue hydrogen, when you look at the prices at the moment, um, is out now and um, is not an option anymore. So I think it has changed a lot. In the end, I think um, this will accelerate the transition to, to net zero for Germany. Um, but um, it's, it's not clear how we get there because our plan was to use the uh, cheap Russian gas for, for electricity production in the meantime. And this uh, will change now and we'll see much more coal-fired uh, power plants and probably also more nuclear. Yeah, and I, I would I would second uh, what what Philip has said. So a, a lot has changed, especially uh, for the coming years, and 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 how we want to um, sort of fill that gap um, of of uh, natural gas from Russia that is there, of course. But what's been made very clear from the German government uh, is that they're gonna want to expedite the energy transition and and keep to their targets to for climate neutrality so really um what we've been doing all along but not quickly enough is really the solution also to this crisis of course not not this year not the next year but in in the mid uh, and, and and long term i've i've just read an article today about um a german steel producer that is um making its um, uh, its steel production right now dependent on when wind and solar generation is really high. So renewable, the, the, the build out of renewable electricity is really going to be a, a priority of in, in the coming years and the, the energy transition as a whole. And it's correct what, what Philip has been saying this, um, because in Germany, the, the priority is really clear. We want to um, go with green hydrogen in, in the future. And there's been this debate about a blue hydrogen bridge in between. And um, right now, due to the increased natural gas prices, this bridge is uh, becoming more and more uncertain. And, and uh, we're expecting that green hydrogen is going to become competitive um, with blue earlier than we thought. So at the same time, green hydrogen it's not really going to make a big difference to the energy crisis of, of this year and the coming years. It's uh, even in, the, in, in, in 2030, it's going to make, it's, it's still going to contribute little to over, overall energy demand. But then in, especially in the midterm and, and in the long term, it's going to help us become independent um, of fossil fuels. But after direct electrification, of course. I would um, like to echo what has been said by um, Jens and Philip, and maybe add um, another perspective on this. So, um, you know, there, there has been this ex expectation that blue hydrogen can be a bridge technology, and I agree with uh, what has just been said um, on that. On the same time, if um, people want blue hydrogen to be a bridging technology in Europe and Germany, we actually need to take undertake actively measures for that to happen because if we don't undertake these regulatory measures it will just not happen and so far i i mean i think the discussion is changing but so far i don't see a lot of appetite in changing the regulation for example support for green hydrogen um, which is not granted for blue hydrogen so um, this is one thing and i think what's probably even more important to that is that we need to um, really be clear about the fact that we will need to import the majority or at least a substantial part of our um, hydrogen consumption, green hydrogen consumption um, in Germany and in Europe as well. And so far we have a um, hydrogen strategy um, on the European level, we have a hydrogen strategy on the German level, um, but while they are more or less specific uh, when it comes to domestic policies or European policies, um, they are not clear at all when it comes to import. And I think we need, we really need um, a comprehensive import strategy addressing not only our concerns um, as a consumer, but also addressing the concerns um, of, of suppliers, since at the end of the day, um, Germany is in a global competition for 
um, a limited um, amount or quantity of hydrogen, at least in the beginning. So this is something we need to take very um, seriously and uh, which also will require more strategic thinking and actually a hydrogen import strategy, which needs to be spelled out. Mm -hmm. um, maybe if I could uh, jump in then on the Canadian side. Um, it is very, it, uh, now, um, it's always useful to remember geography. And so Canada as a natural gas exporter is in a different situation from continental Europe or from Europe which is a natural gas importer. And so our cost of natural gas is very different from the European cost. Always has been, and with this war, it has, that difference has, has spiked significantly. Uh, and so it's premature to assume that the natural gas price in Europe, um, right now, blue hydrogen wouldn't make sense because for a temporary time period, natural gas prices are very elevated. Um, hopefully that abates somewhat as the war reaches a, a conclusion as, as policies roll through, uh, but natural gas will always be cheaper in North America, in Canada especially, uh, as in Europe. Um, I would uh, also want to note that, um, again, Europe is uh, Europe must do what is in Europe's best interests. Uh, there are some policy decisions which perhaps a couple years ago, um, perhaps relating to nuclear, which had almost universal support, which are now being thought through again in terms of the lens of energy security. Um, as such, uh, recognizing that it's incumbent on Canada and others to uh, advocate for a more uh, technology neutral approaches, I wouldn't uh, assume that the door is shut on blue hydrogen, on hydrogen generated uh, from natural gas. Uh, perhaps even turquoise hydrogen, where we have cheap natural gas and cheap electricity, where we don't form CO2 in the first place, but rather carbon black, uh, might even be another alternative. Um, so just want to add that uh, that context to the discussion. Thanks, Matthew. And I'll just, I'll just add also, in the Canadian hydrogen strategy from Natural Resources Canada, um, it is is it is very favorable for blue hydrogen. It definitely sees a role for blue hydrogen, which is very different from the European context. And I just want to highlight the point that Matthew makes. The natural gas out of Alberta, BC right now is the cheapest in the world. And it's because we can't export it to global markets where we would get a, a better price for it. But I think that makes our potential to produce blue hydrogen in a very cost competitive way. And obviously the easier place to ship that to is California and Asia. But because prices for natural gas and electricity are so high in Europe, I wonder if there isn't a business case to ship blue hydrogen, you know, from the, from the west coast of Canada, even to Europe, as, as we try to build a use case and try to make green hydrogen cheaper and more competitive. Um, so, so, you know, from, from a perspective of the oil and gas industry in Canada and from Alberta, we have such an advantage in blue hydrogen, actually. Maybe I can comment just briefly. It's it's. Um, I mean, we can we can go into the whole debate about the emission intensity of of fossil based hydrogen and how that can really um, um, compare to to those of renewable hydrogen. But if we just look at the issues, Heather, that you lined out in terms of building out the infrastructure, I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of kilometers between Alberta and the east coast of Canada, from which the ships would then cross the Atlantic over to Germany. So if, if we don't believe in the sort of the, the, the climate um, promise of, of uh, this green hydrogen export cor corridor from Canada to Germany, then there's really strong as well geographic arguments for, for, for a trading relationship between between Eastern Canada and, and Germany. And, and as you said as well, the, the advantage in that region or the potential in that region is for renewable hydrogen. So that's why we see, um, we see the big potential really in this trading relationship. I, I would want to add one point that's a very, very true, um, uh, Jens, that uh, uh, Eastern Canada, Atlantic Canada, um, will have more of a renewables-based hydrogen approach. Um, one of the reasons there has been opposition to developing uh, export capacity for Canada's fossil fuel sector is that 
the idea is that, well, um, one must constrain exports, otherwise production will simply increase. And this is despite the fact in the oil sector that Canada's oil is some of the more expensive oil to make. Uh, the point I want to reach is that energy is unlike some other commodities where um, you don't have to be the lowest cost supplier or the lowest cost technology path in order to supply a market. There is an appreciation of different uh, geographic diversity, different supply. Um, if it was a lowest cost takes all kind of an approach, then you know Saudi Arabia would supply all the world with oil. Um, as such, you know, appreciating the uh, the the, the ge geography of Europe relative to Canada, uh, there would be a lot of a uh, sense on the green hydrogen side. Um, one does not need to be the lowest cost uh, provider uh, to secure a, a hefty demand, a large demand for energy, as that is what uh, you know, the broader world, especially the global south, uh, will be very interested in having. Great stuff. Um, I thought I'd uh, pitch a question to our Canadian plan panelists now. And I know, Heather, you've already talked um, at considerable length about the challenges in this country of getting projects built. And indeed, the fact that we had not been building projects up until this point is, is part of the reason that we're playing catch up now. And I think, as Jens alluded to, you know, some of the opportunity that might otherwise be there, the fact that we're starting so late, late has sort of foreclosed or diminished the opportunity to exploit those. I guess I, I put to you both, uh, Heather and, and Matthew, I mean, do you think that the situation in Europe has, has led to a shift in mindset in Canada? Is there a recognition that perhaps uh, Canada was uh, made a mistake in the past and that we should not make the same mistake in the future by ensuring that we can actually get stuff built in this country? I think, yeah, I, and I think as, as we see Europe struggle, and you know, lots of places are struggling with, with oil and gas prices right now, but it'll hit different for Canadians when we see Europe struggling. Um, and so there will be much more political support and pressure, I think, and we've already seen it with LNG. But with, you know, we're not too late on hydrogen is the beauty of all this. No one is too late on hydrogen yet. Um, and so, you know, as you know, we saw in Philip's map at the beginning, when you look at a globe and you look at where Europe is and you look at who has potential in renewables and electricity, the first place you want to go, well, maybe Iceland and good for the Icelanders and their geothermal. But there's Canada, huge Canada with all this potential right next door, a friendly ally. And so we've, you know, we are definitely not too late on hydrogen, but I just hope that we don't make the same mistakes or politicize this in the way that we have before so that it becomes an identity politics issue instead of uh, an export opportunity that we actually need energy. We should export our natural resources. Uh, there's a willing buyer uh, and then it does overall net good for the world. And so absolutely not too late on hydrogen, but um, let's try not to make the same mistakes that we've made in the past decade. Sure, maybe maybe uh, building on what Heather noted, um, I think I think and hope that we have uh, we will have something of a culture shift where when we have talked about energy from Canada historically, it's all been fossil fuels which are very contentious for very uh, you know, obvious reasons. Um, as we move towards a world where we are trading very low carbon energy, I'm hopeful that we can be more. Uh, you know, project development focused, uh, more export focused than before. Uh, I will say one thing that the United States did have an advantage over Canada when it comes to LNG is there are already massive, massive petrochemical complexes uh, in, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, near Texas, for example. So building uh, another facility to process more fossil fuels, process more natural gas, liquefy it and export it. Initially, they were thinking of importing it. Um, is it's like rounding error on the amount of uh, you know, human disturbance to the natural environment. Um, what we have in Canada is uh, because we have we we don't have as many massive complexes near ports. Is that we have the difficulty of going from zero to one projects or zero to two projects, as opposed to the simplicity of going from ten to eleven projects. If you have ten existing uh, petrochemical complexes in in a region. So uh, I do, you know, just wrapping it back, I, I do hope that we have a more um, 
proactive and uh, embracing approach towards the clean energy exports that Canada can uh, provide, not just to Europe, but to Asia as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm mindful of time. I see we've got uh, about 10 minutes left. I have one last uh, question for our uh, German participants. Um, you know, given the Chancellor's recent visit here, um, I know they signed a number of agreements uh, with the Canadian government on a range of things. I, I believe they had a, a agreement to explore. There was, there was uh, obviously hydrogen featured prominently in that. There was an agreement made. Um, I think Canadians are becoming quite skeptical of uh, announcements that are not often followed up with any concrete uh, action. I'm curious as to uh, what the view in Germany was. Uh, in your view, was the German government sort of satisfied with the response they got from the Canadian government on the issue of hydrogen? I, I think I can say that um... The media attention was really high on, on, on that trip and especially the hydrogen agreement. It was really big in the news and, and got a lot of attention. And I think um, it's a really, it's a very good signal. The statement from both countries that they're really interested in this hydrogen export corridor and also that they're committed to support the buildup of that, um, that corridor with, with political support. And, and by, by relaxing uh, regulatory un uncertainties. So I, th I, I think it really sent a, a huge si signal and put Canada as well on the map of potential green hydrogen suppliers um, or hydrogen suppliers in general um, to those uh, which, which didn't have it on their map. I know I've had it on there for a while, <laughs> but um, I agree that there's a lot of uh, challenges in the way, but, but also remember that this signing was uh, was accompanied with a with an exposition of, of of a dozen green hydrogen export projects of private companies, some with with German involvement that have been um, yeah um, ex, ex, ex putting their their project plans on 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 that uh, exposition to show, and there's certain MOUs in place already, so we don't only have the political backing, but we have a genuine interest from the private sector as well. And I think um, that's two um, positive signals uh, in the right direction. Yes, I can uh, I can also, or oh, Bernd, you wanna start or oh, later. Um, I ahead. also want to add, yeah, thanks. Uh, I also want to add some points. I think it was a very, um, good signal to be in Canada because um, in the days before and in the weeks before our min minister of, of um, economic affairs um, was in countries like Qatar, UAE and so on and so on. Um, and I think it's uh, for the society, it's a good signal that we have partners in the world like Canada where we share the same values um, and have the same idea for, uh, of democracy and so on. And I think this is also a very strong signal which comes from this, um, from this visit. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Philip. Um, I think what is also encouraging is um, that besides Canada, um, there's also um, an agreement um, on the Australian-German uh, uh, hydrogen um, uh, accord, it's called. And uh, what's encouraging about that is that it was signed, I think, in June um, 2021. And then shortly after, in a few months' time, it was followed by um, an agreement between um, Fortescue and uh, the German company um, Covestro to supply actually 100 tons of ammonia starting 2024. There are other ambitious targets, especially concern um, regarding the price um, for producing the hydrogen. So I think that's that's encouraging, of course, to see that there is a lot of appetite. There is a lot of um, political engagement, definitely something that we also will need. And to see um, that there is a pace uh, when it comes to, to developing the hydrogen partnership. So um, as I said, I think a very important first step and I hope many steps um, will follow. 
That's great. Um, I know we've only got a few minutes. I want to give everybody, uh, before we end, just a couple of moments to have a few comments. I, I did see in the audience questions, there were a lot of questions regarding um, timing, a lot of questions about how quickly could this happen. So I don't know if anyone, before we get to the final remarks, what is the sort of best case scenario? How quickly, if everything goes as well as could be hoped, how soon could we see uh, hydrogen experts going from Canada to Germany? I think um, the best case is is uh, sort of following the, the 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 targets that's been agreed in in, in the hydrogen alliance. So first projects um, going off the ground um, by 2025, and then the shipments of these projects um, beginning in 26, 27, and then I I think not before the 2030s we can um, we can sort of foresee this this transatlantic hydrogen trade to go uh, beyond the individual project level and to, to have a significant impact also on, on energy supply in, in, in Germany. Okay, that's useful. That's uh, all uh, just underscores the importance of starting these things early because the uh, the the payoff is quite far down the road, especially uh, through a political lens. So maybe I'll just sort of go around the circle with just some concluding concluding thoughts on you know what uh, what you hope to see, what you'll be looking for, or you know whether you're pessimistic or optimistic about um, what the future holds. Heather. Well, I'll I'll say, you know, sometimes we feel like you know Canada has missed the boat but there's still 8 billion people on this world. There'll soon be 9 billion. We will only need more energy and all forms of energy. And I think hydrogen is a great opportunity for Canada. Um, you know, we have had, I, I would guess, a comparatively slow last 20 years on the energy side. We can be an energy superpower. We should be an energy superpower. Our European allies are looking to us to provide that. Uh, what, you know, the question is, you know, we could start exporting. Canada's already a top 10 exporter of of hydrogen, mostly in the form of ammonia, um, we could be exporting more, but we still need to develop the use of hydrogen. You know, that's, you know, so, so how fast can you export depends to some degree on how fast are you going to start using it and how much are you going to start needing? And, um, you know, that, that's, that's still happening. These things take time, but there's no, there's no missing the boat, I think, on using and shipping energy. We will always need energy. The more energy humans use, the better their, their human development is. It's strongly correlated with every single kind of, you know, literacy, mortality, gender equality, everything. And so we do want cheap, accessible, affordable, clean energy for everyone everywhere. And Canada has a huge role to play in that. You're muted there, Aaron. Uh, we'll go to you, Philip. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Heather. Uh, it was very interesting. Um, I think what is the the most um, urgent for for Europe is to make the legal framework clear. So, which kind of hydrogen we want to produce here? What want we? Uh, what do we want to import? Um, and um, I also think that we need blue hydrogen to ramp up the hydrogen economy worldwide. So to get hydrogen into the applications and to build these, uh, these links, for example, from uh, Canada to, uh, to Germany and, and to Europe. So I think this is also very important to not focus too much on green hydrogen, but make it possible to, to see more solutions like blue or Turkish hydrogen. Of course, we have to have a look that we do not have a lot of stranded assets then and we have no lock-in effects. I think this is also very important to monitor, um, but I think we have to be fast now and this is why we need also blue hydrogen and other, and other colors. Okay, uh, Jens. Yes, thank you. Um, Mm, yeah, maybe I want to end with uh, because I, I was I was there as well in in Stephenville and the excitement uh, you could feel in that region and I spoke to the mayor of Stephenville and others um, others there. There's really, I think it's it's seen that is a it's a huge economic op opportunity for the region in Atlantic Canada to 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 supply green energy to Europe and to Germany. And it um, and it it's an opportunity for economic diversification, and it's also an opportunity to 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 keep educated young people in the region and and have 
uh, good paying jobs in the regions. So um, it's a great opportunity for Canada economically, but also, of course, for Germany in, in terms of its energy transition goals and in, in terms of gaining a very reliable, uh, democratic, long, long-standing partner such as Canada in its, uh, in, in its import mix of energy. So the, the opportunities are clear. As we've talked about some, there's, there's challenges in the way in terms of certification, in terms of ch- shipping. Um, and, and that's why it's important that, that both governments and, and, and businesses continue to, to work together on those and, and, and help first projects to get off the ground. Great, thank you. Thank you. And uh, Matthew. Sure, thank you very much, um, Aaron, and thanks everyone. Um, yeah, so um, just reiterating, prefacing that the Canadian Hydrogen Fuel Cell Association, if readers do have questions, they can pop over to our website, chfca.ca, ask questions, there's ways, ways to contact us. Uh, we are uh, colorblind when it comes to hydrogen, just the emissions count. Building on what Yen said, um, to date, Canada's renewable energy has been landlocked. There's never been a way to export some of our electricity potential, and that's held back many of these communities in Atlantic Canada because there's not that much population there. You've got to build hundreds of kilometers of transmission line to get to the US, which doesn't always like transmission lines. So there's this wonderful way that hydrogen is is a vector, is a way, it's a carrier, I guess, for the green electricity that Atlantic Canada can provide with Europe nearby. So it is a very exciting time. I hope that we're able to capitalize on this to the fullest even as I hope that in other parts of Canada, we have opportunities for other types of hydrogen resources uh, to flourish, uh, providing clean energy to the rest of the world. Thank you so much, Matthew. And Berndt, I'll uh, give the last word to you. And uh, and of course, uh, if you have any concluding remarks for the panel as a whole, please feel free. Yeah, thank you very much, Aaron. I think this has been a very insightful discussion on the topic. Um, Many of us are following keenly on both sides of the Atlantic. And um, I think my my three main takeaways are that uh, Canada definitely has the potential to contribute to decarbonization globally and particularly in Europe. This is also true for the question of security of supply in the mid and in the long term. Um, We definitely also have uh, significant challenges ahead and um, from a European perspective, I think we need to do our homework as well. So we need to be very clear about the regulatory framework. Uh, We need to have an import um, strategy and uh, potentially we also need to um, uh, reopen the debate on on blue hydrogen, at least uh, for for the ramp up. Um, In any case, we need very um, precise and clear instruments. Um, so I, we look uh, very much forward um, uh, to continuing this uh, discussion and uh, share the findings, which we already have shared during this conversation, but also um, sharing the findings in form of um, a publication of a paper, which should be online on the MLI website and on the EPICO website very soon. And um, yeah, final remark just on behalf of EPICO, I would like uh, to thank you for joining the event, of course, thanking the panelists. Thanking you, Aaron, for moderating this in such a charming way. I'm thanking MLI for the cooperation and also the Konrad Adenauer Foundation in Canada for its support of the project. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bernd. Uh, I'll echo your thanks to all the panelists and our teams at MLI and Epico for putting this on. And last but not least, of course, you, the viewer, for joining us. I hope you found it as informative uh, and interesting as I did. We'll see you next time.